Hello, welcome to this week's Lunch and Learn webinar for Small Ruminants. I'm your host, Sarah Jemanski, Extension Educator for Agriculture and Natural Resources with Purdue University Extension. And joining me today is my colleague, Mary Rodenhus, who is also an Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator with Purdue Extension. And I'll let her start off the presentation today and she can introduce herself. Hi everybody, I want to thank Sarah for uh, letting me join you guys today. Um, like she said, I'm the Ag Natural Resource Extension Educator um, in Franklin County, so the southeast part of the state. Um, I've, I've been raising uh, lambs for about nine years now. Uh, my boyfriend and I have wool sheep. Uh, we've got Hampshire's, Dorsets, and South Downs. Um, so you know, again, please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll try to uh, do the best to keep um, Keep up with those questions as they come through and uh, we'll get started. So the best part, I'm always about being prepared. Um, you know, we always like use to, to operate on their own schedule. I'd like to use to tell me, uh, you know, when exactly they're going to be lambing to make it easier on us to fit in our schedules, right? Um, but they operate on their own schedule, but there's a lot of signs um, that for us to be prepared for, to be looking at, um, then we're always having our toolbox and our supplies ready um, so that when our ewes and does um, start having babies, that it doesn't take us by complete surprise. So the first thing, um, to be not surprised, we have to know when to expect uh, babies to, to land on the ground, right? Um, so gestation for our small ruminants, you know, it's about the 150 days, uh, plus or minus five days. You know, um, it, it, about in there is about when we start looking. Um, it can go a little bit earlier than that. They can go a little bit later. It just depends, um, you know, a lot about genetics. Um, and so if you keep good records, you can also keep a really good track of when a you generally um, is in her gestation length and when to expecting if she's going to go late or early. Um, but in order to know when to expe be expecting, we have to know our records and our breeding dates. Um, and so there's a couple ways to do this. Hand breeding is, is the best way to have 100%, um, you know, complete records. So hand breeding is when you have um, something tell you that your dozer or your user in heat. A lot of times this may be a, a teaser buck, a teaser ram. So a ram that's still intact, but um, has been uh, surgically castrated. And so they'll still pick up on, on the hormones and do um, all of the acts as our normal rams and bucks and just indicate that our um, ewes and our does are coming into heat. And then you take those, um, uh, those ewes or does and, and put them with the buck that you want them to be breeding with on that certain day. Um, this is a little bit more uh, management um, or time uh, on our hands. And so if you don't have the capability or you don't have enough pins to be able to do that, um, using a marking harness when we have bucks out is going to be key in kind of getting um, a pretty accurate date on when those animals um, got bred. So the marking harnesses, they go around their chest. Um, you see that that top middle picture there of those green and the red crowns that gets put on that marking harness. Um, and then when they go to breed that animal, um, the dam, it leaves a nice colored mark that you can see and be able to um, write down that breeding date. It's really important uh, to keep really good accurate records to do this at least once a day, um, if not twice a day, so we know exactly when our, our ewes or our does are getting bred. Um, so that we can have those those records to know when to start expecting babies. It also is really important if you switch rams uh, to switch the color of the the marker that you're using, so that you know exactly uh, who that animal is bred by. Uh, we also like to switch our our markers every 21 days or every heat cycle, so that we know exactly um, when they're getting bred. If they recycle, it's a different color. Um, if they're getting Rebred again, um, so that's an easy way uh, to pick that difference up um, and to be able to to view that from a far distance. One Mary, with, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. We have a question from one of our listeners. It's will marking harness ruin the wool from wool breeds? Uh, yeah. So that's um, always a potential. Uh, it, it makes that indentation there. Um, 
However, with our rams, that wool quality, uh, because of all the, the secretions and um, that they have, um, it can damage it anyway. So our rams, they, we don't necessarily get good quality wool out of them um, necessarily either. But yeah, it can damage um, that wool because it can kind of color, make that a different color. Um, so that is a, a possibility. So if you if you have that concern, um, hand breeding might be the best um, case to go. Um, if you're worried about that marking harness, um, another another thing you can use is called rattle powder. Um, it's that that bottom uh, blue bucket there. This will definitely uh, discolor the wool on your um, sheep, though. So if, if that again, that's a a concern of yours, uh, you probably want to stray away from this. That rattle powder is um, a powder you mix with like uh, oil, so vegetable oil, canola oil, and then you hand apply that. Um, to the chest area, and so once uh, that ram is breeding the females, um, or that buck's breeding your females, it, it passes some of that powder onto uh, the same area. The biggest downside um, about rattle powder is that it is more labor intensive. You have to reapply it to make sure you're getting that uh, the transfer of that product uh, to our ewes and our does, um, and it can get pretty messy. It gets all over your hands, uh, so I suggest wearing gloves. Uh, but that's an option if you're worried about, you know, the marking harness or getting caught on something, getting a leg, um, you know, caught up in there somehow. Uh, that's a that's a way you can go on the on the rattle powder there. Uh, and again, just keep those records, keep track of, of the day you you see color. Um, even if it's just a little bit of color, you think maybe that's a a false jump. Um, keep you know write that mark down. Write it was a light mark, um, and then you'll know if she gets remarked again in the future. Um, you can have those exact dates, and then always uh, keep track of when you're putting rams out um, into the pen with the girls, and then you know bringing that up or switching rams so you know exactly what date um, they started. So, so after we get those bred, we, we know kind of when we're expecting um, our due dates to happen. Um, there's some the key uh, health checks we should be doing. So in our, our using our does about 30 days out um, before lambing or kidding, we should vaccinate with CDT. We have a picture um, of that bottle there in the bottom right corner. Um, this helps pass along um, this the, the immunity to the, the lambs and the kids through the colostrum when they're first born. Um, and so making sure we get them vaccinated before lambing or kidding um, is key to, the, to, that, uh, to that new lamb or that new kid's uh, health. If you have a first time mom, uh, they suggest doing uh, two doses. So hitting them at six weeks and then again at three weeks before lambing or kidding be essential to building up that immunity uh, in, in, that, in the colostrum. You also want to check uh, FAMATRA scores uh, to make sure we don't need any deworming at this point. In order to do that, you look at the eyelids. Um, we're going to have uh, a segment a couple in a few more weeks about parasites and deworming and things like that. So come back if you're interested in learning more about FAMATRA score. Um, this is especially important if you're lambing during warm uh, seasons to where those using those does could pick up more worms. Um, and you want to make sure when they're pregnant, you're not using valbazin. Uh, that'll cause abortion. So use a different warmer um, other than valbazin. If uh, Mary, Mary, go, yeah, we have another question from a listener. Okay. If they already had a CDT vaccine this year, but before being bred, do they need it again? Uh, yes, so you want to do it about 30 days before uh, you're kidding or lambing because that'll build up in the colostrum. Then if you have it beforehand, it's not going to be uh, you're not going to have the, the concentration in the colostrum to be effective. Um, in your in your kids or your lambs. All right, so for the CDT, um, you give the mom the full dose both times if you're doing the, the six weeks and the three weeks. Um, again, that's just building up the uh, that in their system, especially if they haven't had uh, multiple doses before. Um, so they're you know, their first time lambing or kidding. Uh, it just builds that up in, in the colostrum. Good questions. Good questions. Um, if Copper bolusing is a part of your uh, your routine. Again, that's going to be in goats only. We don't we don't want to add any extra copper for our sheep. Um, uh, 
uh, it's a good time at this point to go ahead and administer that copper bolus. Um, you know, and that while we're kind of checking, we've got them, we've got to collect it and we're, we're checking them over and um, we don't need to be handling them multiple times. Again, if you've got them caught, go ahead and check their feet and hooves. Uh, make sure you don't need to do any trimming. Uh, get those cut back and make sure that we're not going to have any lameness issues. What is the full dose? Um, I would have to read the bottle. I don't. I don't have the bottle in front of me. Um, read the bottle and dose of what what this says on the bottle to do. Um, we typically on our we actually do about a half a cc. Um, with our lambs and we, well, we can get to this later too, but we don't um, vaccinate or use um, just because of getting that timing just right. So we vaccinate when, when our lambs are born. Um, so we'll do a half a cc when they're, when they're born and then a full cc later when we're, we're banding. Mary, we have another question. Okay. Can you do CD&T and deworm and shear in one day or will that be too stressful? It depends on your flocks, you know, how calm your flock is. Typically, that's what I would suggest. Try to get it, get it done and knocked out all in one day. Um, but if you have a, a flock that's, that's highly stressed or that you don't handle very much, things like that, um, it could be a lot and a lot very stressful. Um, typically, though, in, in, the, in that last kind of 30 days, um, we don't have as much concern about, um, you know, that high of stress causing like abortions like we would in that in those first uh, 30 days uh, of pregnancy. But if you've got a, a flock that's really flighty and, um, you know, catching that you're noticing a lot of stress, you know, try to cut that back. Um, you also don't want to do then like two days back to back uh, because those animals still haven't necessarily calmed down from the first day. So I would suggest probably a week um, kind of between handling, especially like I said, if you have a kind of a flighty flock. Um, we had another question, what days do you vaccinate the first time mom? That would be six weeks before uh, your, your lambing or kidding date and then three weeks ahead of time of lambing and kidding. Um, a couple days uh, before your due date, you want to clean up your, your use and your does uh, to make sure that, you know, you just get rid of any extra hair, any extra wool. Um, you can do this, you know, trim the bellies, trim up the udder, trim up uh, around the vulva. So that's a nice clean environment. Um, again, you've got them caught, check your feet, make sure you don't have any extra growth. Um, and at this point, you can move them to a birthing pen or a jug pen, um, depending on your operation. On our farm, we let our ewes drop um, in our general population. And so we're checking quite frequently, making sure, um, especially, you know, getting close to those uh, gestation, those, those lambing dates, um, we go and check. And then once that, that lamb is dropped, mom's got a chance to clean her off. Then we put her into the jug pen to give them a chance to bond. Um, for us, uh, it, it works in our system. We have a, a general population of, of all pregnant ewes. The cons to this uh, can be if you have multiple uh, ewes or does kidding, laming at the same time, they can try to claim each other, can kind of get confusing. Um, but it also is a good indicator, you know, if you've got a mom, uh, a, a one that's still pregnant, trying to claim another lamb, uh, that, that's a, it's a good indicator that she's getting close uh, to starting or she's kind of in that pre-labor term as well. Um, the biggest benefit for us to be able to keep them out in general population is it keeps them in a bigger area so that they have plenty of area to move around and exercise um, and to help labor keep progressing. So um, if you've ever had, I haven't had kids, but uh, if you've ever had kids, you know, getting up and walking, um, around the hospital can really help labor progress. And that's the same uh, scenario for our does and our ewes. They need that room. They need to be able to get up and exercise and keep things moving. Um, and so if they're in the jug pen already, it can kind of slow labor a little bit. Um, and also can lead if you have them in there for too long of a period um, and they're not moving and exercising potential to put on a little much too much weight and, uh, have, and risk the chance of ketosis. Um, and so there, there's there are pros and cons to both, uh, but for us, we found that it works uh, pretty well. But again, you have to be out checking quite frequently, making sure um, 
know who you're finding animals. We also, at night, we, we lamb um, between November and in March. So in the cold at night, we make sure all of the ewes are locked up in the barn. Um, there's plenty of space in there, but that way they're not out in the mud or the snow, potentially trying to um, to give birth out there too. So there's you've got to kind of set up your system um, to what works for your operation. Um, but at this point, if you're going to be putting them into jug pens, about uh, you don't want to go about three days, three to four days ahead of time. Uh, that due date is, is a good time for that. Any other questions? All right, so we have a, a toolbox that we kind of keep a lot of this stuff in. Uh, that's our kind of our go to. It's, it's in the barn. It's, it's where all of our um, lambing and, and or kidding stuff is. Um, and so for mom, uh, some of the things to have on hand is going to be ketone strips to help diagnose ketosis. Um, if you've never experienced ketosis, it can be a, a, it can be a, a fatal disease. Um, or if you've heard of pregnancy toxemia, that's uh, ketosis. Um, you can also diagnose this by a sweet smell. Um, if you have a, we're in, Sarah's going to talk about uh, ketosis a little bit more in depth, but if you have a you or a doe that you're suspecting uh, is potentially ketotic, um, you can it, smell their breath. And if it's sweet, that's an indicator they're in ketosis. Um, always have propylene glycol uh, or nutridense molasses caro syrup on hand. Uh, that picture of power punch there in the corner that has propylene glycol and molasses all in it. Um, that has a treatment for ketosis. And also if you've got a, a weak you or a weak lamb, we can give that that to kind of help perk them up. If you uh, have a calcium deficiency or milk fever, uh, have Tums is an easy way to get some calcium uh, to those ewes. Have a syringe and needle in case you need to uh, administer anything. Um, the, the dosing syringe without a needle or that kind of drench gun there. Uh, that's what we use to uh, admit the, the power punch there. Um, to the use it's, it's an easy way to get it down into their throats. Um, and then always have your number of your vet on hand you know, in your house, in your phone, in your barn, uh, write it down multiple places so that everybody can have access to it and find it relatively quickly in case you have an emergency situation. forward Sarah well we have a couple of questions oh okay yeah so okay so I see one is do you pop tums in their mouth um, we will actually crush them and then put them with a little bit of water and bring them up in that syringe and get them back in their throat to ensure um, that it gets back and gets administered to them and as far as dosage, work with your veterinarian because yes. it's going to differ depending on the animal. Yeah, definitely. And then some of the other questions we have, you know, we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. For our lambing and kidding supplies, um, you want to make sure you've got fresh, clean towels out there in case you need to get down there and uh, clean up the animals or warm them up quick. Um, you have betadine, chlorhexidine to help clean up mom or to dip navels. Uh, it's always good to have some exam gloves. I know they're kind of hard to find right now. Um, we always order a box or two and keep them on hand um, in case you need to assist or go in and check on mom. Um, additionally, you want to lube. You want to always make sure that um, you're using lube whenever you have to go in and assist or check um, just to help make sure you're not going to be doing more damage uh, to that area. Um, a flashlight or a headlight is, is good uh, to have in case you have you know dark spots or you want to go check the barn real quick without turning all of the lights on and, and disturbing all of the animals. Um, injectable oxytocin, uh, that's going to be for any retained placentas. Um, or if you have a, a, a you or a doe that you've noticed isn't progressing as quickly as she should be. Um, so the oxytocin is basically going to stimulate contractions. And so that'll help if, if your, uh, your dam hasn't passed her placenta totally. It'll help um, with the contractions and pass that placenta. Or again, if they're, they're stalled labor to help um, get that process going again. You want to make sure, though, that you're 100% sure um, that you or that doe is in labor before you do oxytocin. Um, 
So you're not, you know, inducing that animal when she's actually not ready or in, in full labor yet. So if you're not sure about that, contact your veterinarian, um, you know, they may come out or, or tell them exactly what's going on and they can help you make that determination if you need to use oxytocin or not. Um, the hemostat or umbilical clamp uh, are good if those if the umbilical cord isn't isn't quite uh, clamped off yet. You need to make sure that your infection is going to get up there. Um, or in the puppy training pads, it gives you a disposable area that can kind of be kind of clean, especially if you need to be uh, warming that animal up or tubing things like that. Um, and then you can just throw that away. You don't have um, you know a towel or something that kind of is wet and damp, um, but it helps get a nice clean surface. For newborn care, um, if all of these things are very important, but the, the lamb tube um, is, is especially important, especially if you have a weak lamb, one that can't get up and nurse on its own, having that tube there to be able to get a uh, colostrum or milk um, to it is key. So that's that picture up in the, the top left picture um, is, a, is a big a syringe basically and a tube on the end of that. Um, the, the Pritchard nipples are there on the left bottom uh, picture. Uh, those go on most of our uh, empty soda bottles. So keep your, your soda bottles instead of recycling them. Um, so you have those in case you need to bottle feed. Um, that's really the best um, for, for young, uh, you know, newborns getting started um, and can work as you get a little bit older. If you have a couple, you know, one or two bottle babies, if you have a dairy goat operation where you're you're mass feed bottle feeding a lot of uh, kids, then obviously you're going to put them on a bucket or something like that. And we've got a picture of something like uh, of that later on. You always, it's always a good idea to have colostrum on hand in case you have a mom with a, the heart udder or won't claim or your things like that, or if that you dies um, while giving you know birth. Um, Having colostrum on hand is it's going to be important to getting that immunity uh, started in that baby, um, and this could either come from you know uh, milking out a mom that has extra, maybe um, she lost a lamb or she just milks really heavy for one uh, lamb or kid. You can milk her out and freeze uh, some of that extra colostrum, or having colostrum supplement um, or replacer on hand um, is important too. Uh, same with milk or milk replacer. It's really important though to know what you're buying. Um, so colostrum and milk supplement is for um, supplementing that animal. So they're getting a little bit from mom, they just need a little bit extra. Um, that's where the supplementation occurs. If you are trying to replace uh, their colostrum or their milk completely with a supplement, they're not getting enough nutrients in there. So you may make sure that you find a colostrum or a milk replacer. So reading the bag, reading the label, make sure you know exactly what you're buying so that um, they're getting the proper nutrients when they're born. Having uh, something to heat them up is, is going to be important. So a hairdryer, heating pad, hot water bottle. Um, with the hairdryer, make sure you're not doing direct heat onto the skin because you can burn them. So uh, we like to wrap a towel around uh, the, the, the lamb um, and then get the hairdryer under there, kind of blow up and get the hot air kind of surrounding um, if you need to warm it up. The bulb syringe uh, will be for you know clearing nasal passages. Uh, having a thermometer and stethoscope will be important for um, just kind of watching the, the temperature and making sure the lungs are clear of any um, any fluid. We uh, look about our, our birthing pin. Uh, we want to make sure it's a clean and a safe space. Um, these these pictures are a really good example of, of a, a nicely constructed uh, birthing pen. You want to make sure, especially if it, you're lambing or kidding in the cold months, that uh, you're indoors, you're 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 out of the wind um, and any rain or snow. Uh, but you also have good ventilation to to make sure you're not getting respiratory issues um, in our newborn. So making sure we have fresh air coming in, but not drafty um, and windy on those newborns. That'll make them cold pretty quick. Uh, the pins, you need to make sure that they're big enough so that the animals can stand up, kind of move around um, without touching either side of the pin. Depending on the, the size of your animals is really going to determine that. Typically, we see about a four foot by five foot, um, or if you have like a bigger framed uh, sheep, a six foot by six foot 
um, you know, but test that out. If you're building your own pins, um, measure out and, or, you know, stick, stick one of your U's in there, one of your biggest U's in there, making sure they can move around um, comfortably and, and be able to, uh, you know, just, you know, move around and not be cramped and tight. Um, I mean, really important for uh, your birthing pins, especially if you introduce your dough um, or your U in there before lambing or kidding, and making sure they can't accidentally drop uh, the baby into water or the food pan. Um, you don't want them to accidentally get into the water that uh, you know the baby can't get out, mom can't get it out, and then you have accidental drowning. So making sure you're really uh, thinking about where those are placed or making sure they're placed out of the way uh, so that you don't have that accidentally happen. And, and then when we talk about bedding, the biggest thing is making sure we don't have too small of particles to get really you know, stuck on uh, that lamb or the kid or to get up um, into the vulva area and cause infections uh, for our mom. So clean straw um, is a really good option, or if it's warm enough, you can get, you know, they're outside a clean grassy area. Um, try to avoid sawdust or really, really fine particles, uh, bare soil, dirty straw, manure pack. Again, all those things are going to increase the chance of infection um, in our ewes and our does. And so making sure it's a clean, um, healthy environment. Uh, what Sarah does is she puts uh, the shavings down to help absorb extra liquid, uh, but there can be kind of small and stick to lots of things. So then straw on top of that to help uh, keep it a clean environment. And so, um, or, you know, you can do just straw depending on how your barn is laid out um, and then where you're, where you're lambing or you're kidding. Um, but, you know, again, keep those animals clean uh, and, and it'll decrease the chance for um, infection going on. Okay, so now we're going to switch over and I'm going to talk about how do you know when your you or your doe is ready to lamb or kid. And so there are various ways you can know. The first thing is know if they're pregnant at all. So there are various pregnancy test options available. The probably the easiest one is using a blood test. This can be done approximately a month after breeding. And then you would, with a blood test, you would draw the blood, either you or your veterinarian, but this is something you can do at home if you learn how to draw blood. And goats and sheep are the easiest animals to draw blood on of any species. They really are the easiest to draw blood on. There are urine tests that are available, but you, know, you have to wait a little bit longer. So you're going to be waiting 50 days for a urine test. And then for those who raise dairy goats, if you are doing DHI testing, some of the DHI labs actually provide pregnancy testing on the milk. So you can do these pregnancy tests, but some things to keep into, into consideration is if you send it too early, then you could get a false negative. If you have a doe or a ewe that was pregnant, but then she resorbs the fetus, the fetus dies early, you can get a false positive. So pregnancy tests are not going to be 100%. We do have a question back from our previous slide. Can you use pine flakes for bedding? This is what we, what Mary was talking about. You can use pine flakes, but they are a little bit small and they can stick to things. And so if you're going to use pine flakes, we prefer that you use something over them, such as straw, newspaper, or something else that can cover the pine flakes. So another way that you can check for pregnancy is by looking at physical signs. Some animals are going to develop physical signs earlier than others. The first sign you're going to see is that the estrus cycles will stop. And so typically you're going to see 13 to 19 days on sheep and 18 to 21 days on goats for a cycle. And so if you get past that window and you don't see a cycle, there's a good chance that she's pregnant, but it depends on the time of year. Dairy goats are seasonal breedings, or are seasonal breeders, and so if you were to breed in February and she didn't come back into heat, it may not be because she's pregnant, it may be because she's just stopped cycling for the year. So that's not going to be 100%, but it is a good way, especially if you're earlier in the breeding season, to tell if they're pregnant. You start to see your other physical signs of pregnancy about 60 to 90 days into gestation. 
So typically the first sign that you're going to see is the vulva is going to start to swell and become soft. And this is because you have relaxin that they're producing, that they're getting ready to, you know, to kid. And so as they go farther into pregnancy, the vulva is going to get bigger and softer. And you're also going to see udder development. And udder development is going to be different on different animals. Typically, if it's an animal that's never lambed or kitted before, it's a pretty good indicator because they'll start developing their udder fairly early. If you have one that's lambed or kitted before, though, they very well may not develop their udder until the day before they kid or even the day of kidding. And so it's not as good of an indicator as the swelling and relaxation of the vulva. And so you can see that you see that image on the right side that shows a swollen vulva. And then a sure way to know if they're pregnant is by using an ultrasound. And then it also offers a way to count the number of fetuses. And so ideally, you would use a transabdominal femoral ultrasound 35 to 90 days post breeding for sheep and 40 to 75 post breeding for goats. And so ideally 65 to 70 days is going to give your your best shot. So if you look at the bottom left picture, that is an ultrasound of a fetus later in gestation. You can actually see the spine of the goat. There's also the option of a preg tone. It's not going to be as exact and it's going to be a little harder to use. And it's, so it's not going to be as accurate as an ultrasound. But the top right picture, that is an example of a preg tone unit. So that's, that's something that you can use kind of at home and it's a little less expensive. Okay, so we have a question. I have one that hasn't kitted and neither show utter development at two weeks out. Both have had a positive ultrasound and we feel babies in there. So utter development can be as little as the day of kitting, or it could be as soon as the day of kitting. So utter development isn't your best gauge of when they're going to kid. There are other signs that are more accurate. And so the swollen vulva is a good sign that they are pregnant. And then we'll look at some other physical signs that they're getting ready to kid. So one of the biggest or the most important signs is right around the tailhead. So about that last month of gestation, we're going to see the tail head start to raise above the pin bones. And there will be a ligament on either side. So it'll kind of make a triangle from the, you know, from toward the hips down toward the pelt or down toward the pin bones and the thurls. And so there will be ligaments on either side. About 24 hours before that you or that doe is going to give birth, those ligaments will disappear. And that's the relaxant doing its job. And so you'll have that raised tailbone, you'll have the ligaments on either side, watch for those ligaments to disappear. When those ligaments disappear, then you need to be able to watch her really closely. Now the picture of the U down at the bottom, she's already lambed, but you can see really distinctly that tailbone up above the, the rump and how those ligaments are totally gone. It takes a little while for that to go back down after lambing or kidding. So that's one of the biggest pre-labor signs. So again, the utter development may start early in pregnancy, particularly with your first fresheners or your first kidders, your first lammers, first time. But you're going to see rapid changes right before lambing or kidding. There are some that they may not fill up. You may not even see an udder until the day of lambing or kidding. What you want to look for is the udder filling with colostrum and not just tissue. And you can have some that'll put a lot of tissue there even, you know, well before lambing or kidding. And so some could be a month before where they're developing the tissue. Some can even put colostrum in a month before. So, but if you see a sudden change in the size of the udder, that's an indication that labor is going to start soon. So in stage one labor, so this is the first part of the birthing process. You're going to, not always, but often you're going to see a full and shiny udder, especially if you see a sudden change in the udder. You will likely see clear to slightly cloudy mucus discharge from the vulva, but you can see mucus even weeks before labor starts. 
because this is the start of the cervical mucus that protects the fetus from being ex that is being expelled. And so this can start even a week or more before labor. But when you start to see more mucus and you start to see kind of a steady mucus discharge, it gives you a good clue that labor is, is starting. And then in early labor, you'll see some mild contractions. So you might see her stand up. And you, you can actually watch sometimes as the, the contractions go through their body. So she's going to get up and get down and paw at the bedding. She's going to be uncomfortable. And so you will see stargazing. So stargazing, they're kind of rolling their head, kind of looking up. You'll see grunting and groaning. You might hear them grinding their teeth. And you'll hear grunting and groaning pretty much any time in the third trimester. They tend to see, I mean, they're very uncomfortable, especially if they're carrying a heavy load of kids. And so the early labor can last anywhere from 1 to 12 hours. If it lasts more than 12 hours, you might want to think about contacting your veterinarian because there might be some reason that labor stalled, maybe malpresentation or something. And so here we have a video of a U that is in the early stages of labor. So you notice how she had her head up and then put it back down. So that was an example of stargazing. Here she goes again. So head up, head down, stargazing. She's getting up. She just kind of looks a little bit miserable. Hear the kind of the grunting and groaning. She's pawing. Okay, so we have a question, what is a trimester? A trimester is one third of the pregnancy. So pregnancy, you know, if we talk about human pregnancy, lasts approximately nine months. And so a trimester is approximately three months with a human. With a goat or sheep, when you have a approximately 150 day plus or minus pregnancy, you're looking at about a 50 day trimester. And so we see more kind of stargazing. She got back down, she's rolling over. So these are different signs that you commonly see in a ewe or a lamb that is an early labor. Okay, so from early labor, we move to active labor. So this is our stage two labor. Stage two labor, we're going to see a much thicker string of mucus appear. And so that's the bulk of the mucus plug that's being expelled from the cervix. You may see this happen in early labor, but often you're going to see this right at the start of active labor. And so from, you know, where you saw a little bit of mucus, just kind of steadily dripping before, now you're going to see this long string of mucus that's going to go down, you know, from her vulva to the ground often. You're going to see her actively pushing. So she may squat to give birth, she may lie down, or she may go back and forth between those positions during active labor. And so usually within about 30 minutes of pushing, you're going to start, you're going to see the amniotic sac. And so once you see the amniotic sac, you, you should see the nose and two feet. And usually you're going to see the feet first and then the nose following shortly behind. The kids or the lambs should come within 30 minutes of each other. If you see more than two hours from the time you have active pushing and there's no sign of a lamb or kid, you probably need to check and see if she needs assistance. Because if she's actively pushing and nothing's coming out, there's something wrong. Okay, so how do we tell if she needs assistance? Well, let's go back to some of the pregnancy problems that we could see. So vaginal prolapses will happen usually in the third trimester. So the last 50 days or so of pregnancy. They're more common in sheep than they are in goats, but they can happen in goats. And the photo that we have is of a Nigerian dwarf goat. And so they're often caused by the increased pressure inside the abdomen because you have a larger uterus. And so it's putting pressure on the vagina. And if the vagina has weak attachments, or it's just, then it can be pushed actually out of the body. 
And so if you have a lot of fat in the abdomen, you have a distended rumen. So the, the rumen, which is the largest part of the stomach, is very full. Plus you have the full uterus. And then you have the relaxation of the pelvic girdle because of the pregnancy hormones. All of this can lead towards a prolapsed vagina. And this can be exacerbated if you have a ewe whose tail is docked too short. And so what you want to do if you have a prolapsed vagina is you're probably going to want to call your vet because they'll need to apply a local anesthetic to the, the organ that's outside of the body. Then that will need to be washed with a disinfectant and then replaced and sutured. And you have to make sure that you remove that suture before they give birth. Or instead of suturing, you may use a prolapse retainer and that's what's shown in the bottom picture. So that's actually stitched to the, the U or the dough to, be, to keep that prolapse or to prevent that prolapse from happening again. And typically if you have this happen in a U or a dough after she gives birth then and raises the lambs or kids, you want to call her. Because if it happens once, it's going to happen again. And so this is not one you want to keep in your breeding herd. Yeah, a lot of times our prolapses are going to be genetically um, linked. And so once it happens once, um, it's more likely going to happen again. And then you don't want to keep any uh, you or, uh, you know, you lambs or doe kids out of her because it's, it's going to be passed uh, through that trait. Okay, so we had some questions earlier about ketosis. Ketosis and pregnancy toxemia share a lot of the same symptoms. But in general, what we want to watch for is we want to watch for them to go off feed. If they go off feed, if they're lethargic, if there's edema in the front legs, these are all signs that there's something going on metabolically. So there's a metabolic problem that we need to address. And so what happens, how this happens is because she's not eating, she's metabolizing fat because she can't meet the caloric needs of her rapidly developing fetuses. And so there are a couple of different reasons why this could happen. One could be that she's severely overweight. And so she has limited room in her gut to be able to actually consume the amount of feed that is necessary to feed these fetuses. The, uh, another thing is that she could be very underweight. So both severely overweight and underweight animals are most at risk. And so for one reason or another, they're just not able to meet the needs through their diet of the fetuses. And so when you have multiples, particularly triplet males, that's when you're, going, you're most likely to see this. And so ketosis is gonna be most common in a doe or a ewe that's carrying triplet bucks or triplet ram kids or lambs. And so for prevention, the biggest thing is to maintain body condition at an appropriate level. So we want to see our ewes and does at a body condition score between three and four, somewhere in that range. Now, to me, the ideal body condition at the time of lambing or kidding is a body condition score of four. You do not want them any higher than a four because then you're at a higher risk for ketosis. Now, if they're at a two, they're also at a higher risk. And so you want to make sure that you provide high quality feed that provides enough energy and to make sure that they continue eating. And so if you're seeing symptoms appear, then you're going to start with treatments. And so dosing two to three ounces of propylene glycol two to three times a day will help prevent ketosis. And then calcium, so calcium deficiency can also mimic this. And so treating with calcium, you should see a rapid improvement. If they don't improve with calcium, then that's when you definitely are going to consider the pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. And the, key, the ketone strips also, you know, so you're going to use those in their urine to be able to determine if they are metabolizing and producing ketones. And so really the best... There was a question on why males, why there's more prevalent in males. Do you? Typically they're bigger and they have higher caloric demands than female lambs and kids. 
And that's why we typically see it with, with male lambs and kittens. And again, it's, it's the demands that they have on their mother's body. They're just, they're just harder on mom. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> they're harder on mom. Okay, but really the best thing to do if you're late enough in pregnancy is to induce delivery. You will notice that once she gets rid of that load of lambs or kids, that she will improve very rapidly. And so if it's late enough in pregnancy, inducing delivery is the best treatment for ketosis. And so, okay, so calcium deficiency, it can be called milk fever. And so the symptoms are very similar to pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. They also occur typically within the last few weeks of gestation. And again, it's most common with multiple fetuses. So you have a lot of the same predisposing factors. This is caused by low serum calcium with a high calcium demand. So again, you have a high, heavy load of kids where, or lambs where they have a high demand for calcium to be able to build their bones. And the mother just can't bring enough calcium out of her own bones to give to them and she can't bring enough out of her diet and so she has low serum calcium and so to prevent this you want to make sure that she has calcium rich foods such as alfalfa in the diet and now so what you're going to do is earlier in gestation you're going to limit alfalfa in your high protein feeds because that can lead to large lamb and kid size but once you're in the last few weeks of pregnancy you want to reintroduce your legumes such as alfalfa that have a high calcium content and higher protein back into the diet. And then if you have, if you're going to be lambing kidding in the winter, you want to make sure you have enough vitamin D in the diet. Because vitamin D is related to calcium absorption. You want to make sure that you're monitoring their feed intake. So if they're not eating a whole lot of food, you want to make sure you're supplementing calcium. And then if you do see symptoms, then intravenous calcium, they will, they will perk up pretty much immediately. You could have one that's down, you give them intravenous calcium, they'll immediately recover. So that's one way that you know it's this and not ketosis or pregnancy toxemia. Um, you can overdose in calcium though too much. So if you're doing intravenous calcium, make sure you're working with your vet um, so that you're not providing um, way too much calcium. Exactly. Anytime you're going to be doing something intravenously, I would strongly recommend working with your vet. And, you know, with anything that you need to dose, work with your vet on the dosage. Okay. Okay, so a question, if you, if you run out of alfalfa hay, you could use alfalfa cubes or alfalfa pellets instead of hay. So as long as you have a calcium, the key is you need a calcium and protein source in the diet. The protein source is important to have, so they have some resistance to the parasites at the end of the pregnancy as well. But some kind of calcium and protein source is important at the end of gestation. So it could be through alfalfa pellets, it could be through alfalfa cubes, it doesn't have to be hay. Clover is also a good, uh, you know, legume to feed as well. It's got a lot of similar um, attributes right. like alfalfa. Yeah, clover is very similar to alfalfa in the composition. You want to make sure you're planning out your forage um, all throughout your uh, your breeding season and your gestation uh, to making sure that you keep that high quality alfalfa and stuff for, you know, late gestation, early lactation period, because that's when those use and those does really, really need it. So, um, you know, kind of watch what you use the year before, um, if you have about the same number of animals um, and making sure you have that amount stocked up going into gestation uh, will be key in, in making sure you don't run out. Okay, so if you're letting them out in an area with a lot of clover and grass, that's a possibility. You just want to make sure you don't introduce that too quickly because then you can have other issues, you know, metabolic issues such as bloat because you don't want to introduce that kind of stuff too quickly. So I would limit feed them on that, maybe two hours a day. Okay, so should she be induced? So there are a few situations where you might want to induce parturition, so induce lambing or kidding. So 
you want to make sure, and this is where keeping your breeding records is so important. You want to make sure that it's been at least 144 days since breeding. And if she's showing signs of pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. So she has swollen legs, she's not eating, she's just acting off. That's a, and it's been at least 144 days, then yes, go ahead and induce. Or if it's been at least 144 days since breeding and you're anticipating problems and you want to make sure that you're going to be present at the birth. So if you have one, maybe she, maybe it's a birth after a C-section or you have one that is extremely obese and you're afraid that the kids might get stuck or she's had kidding problems or lambing problems in the past, you want to be there. So you can time her lambing or kidding to your schedule. That is perfectly acceptable as long as it's been at least 144 days. The other reason is if it's been more than 155 days since breeding and you're concerned about the size of the kid or the health of the doe with her going over. And so a lot of times if you get one that goes past 155 days, they're carrying a single. And if you have a doe or a ewe that has narrow hips and you're concerned about the size of it, you might want to consider inducing. Do not induce if it's been less than 144 days and the ewe or the doe is not in extreme distress or you do not have an exact breeding date and the you or the doe is not in extreme distress. So the key is if it's earlier than 144 days, you only want to induce to save the doe. If she's gonna, if it's a choice of lose her or lose all of them, then you can induce earlier. And then you can maybe take a chance with preemies. But if, it, if it's not an emergency and it's been less than 144 days, you're best off not inducing. But there are emergency situations such as ketosis where you might decide to induce early just to try to save the dough. And then it comes down to what do you value more, the dough or the chance that maybe she has healthy kids, but chances are if you have a dough that's in that much distress, you're not going to save the kids regardless. And so work with your veterinarian on an induction protocol. You know, a dosage for you typically I would use Lutal Ice, but work with your vet on a dosage and, and what you should use. So there are different positions that you'll see lambs and kids in when they're birthed. The normal presentation is going to be a nose and two front feet. So typically you'll see your front feet first, then the nose following shortly behind. And so that is your normal presentation. There's no assistance needed with normal presentation unless you have a very large kid or you have a doe or a ewe with narrow hips. In that latter case, if you have a doe or ewe that has trouble kidding or lambing with a normal birthing position, then cull her. That's something you don't want in your herd or flock. And so if she has trouble kidding and there's not a, there's not a problem with the position, she's not worth keeping. So here's an example of a normal birth. I give minor assistance in this, but the assistance wasn't necessary. She would have had them anyway. So here we can see the amniotic sac with the feet and the head that popped out really nicely. And you see it's already trying to breathe, even though it's not even out of the goat. So this is a yearling doe. This is her first kidding. And so in this case, we have a kid that's a normal sized kid, but we have kind of a small doe. She can have her, she can have this kid fine, but a little traction down towards the feet will help just to kind of ease it out. Sometimes the shoulders will get stuck, and so just giving that little bit of traction at the beginning to get the shoulders out, and the rest of the lamb or kid will just come out really quickly. So in most cases, a you or a doe will have the lambs or kids unassistance. 
or with, without assistance. Sometimes the manual guidance can make the process a little bit smoother, but most of mine actually, they just like to land, or they just like to kid when, when I go inside. So the, the doe will be, she'll be in labor, I'll go inside and then I'll come out 30 minutes later and there are kids on the ground. And so mine, you know, they all have nice big white hips. They generally kid on their own without any assistance. And so there are various positions. Some I don't really worry about because they're not, you know, with minimal assistance, they can have them or maybe even without assistance at all. So nose and one front leg, this is fairly common. You see this a lot when you have big shouldered kids. And so it's a variation on normal. And so this can be the easiest birthing position if you have a doe or you with narrower hips or you have a really big shouldered kid. And so then you get your shoulders where they're, it makes those shoulders a little bit smaller for the kid to be able to come out. Sometimes, the, especially a smaller doe might need a little bit of assistance attraction with this. But again, in this case, you're going to have your head and one leg. Those will come out and just kind of gently guide it down toward her hind feet. It's a pretty easy birthing position to work with. Hawks first is not uncommon. It's not the most common position, but if you, if she's coming, if you go and you feel hawks, again, that provides a fairly smooth way out. It doesn't take too much to get a kid out that's coming hawks first because it's a, the hawks are again, kind of pointy. So they can, they come out fairly easily. Two back feet with the dew claws down. So if the dew claws are down, that means the kid is coming upside down. Again, this is not your ideal position, but she can spit it out fairly easily with, again, minimal assistance. The positions that I'd be more worried about are true breach. So tail first. It's going to be a little bit harder. You have a kind of a wider area of the kid that needs to come out. And so while they can come out tail first, you're better off pushing the kid back in and trying to get the hocks or the hind legs out first, and then it'll come on out. Two front feet, but no nose. That's one that you absolutely have to reposition. In this case, you're gonna have to push the kid back in and go fishing for, and go fishing for the head. You need to get that nose out. And now one thing, probably the scariest position I've dealt with is the spine first presentation. This happens when the kid starts out in normal position but misses the birthing canal. And so if you see a doe that's in labor for a long time and she just hasn't and nothing's coming out, you very well may have a spine first presentation. I had this happen with a doe several years ago and I was able to, it took me a while, but I was able to reposition the kid to where I pushed the kid farther in and I was able to get the back feet out and she came out upside down and backwards, but she came out and she was fine. And that kid survived and the kids after her survived. Then head with no front feet. So in this case, you're going to end up with the shoulders locking in the pelvis. So in order for this to come out, you're going to have to push it back enough so you can bring one foot forward. So you're going to have to do some repositioning there. So it's going to take one foot forward in order to be able to get this kid out. If you have front and back foot coming at the same time, again, you're going to have to feel in order to be able to determine that that's what's happening. In that case, you're going to try to push it back and get the head and one front foot or something like that in order to be able to get the kid out. Another issue is feet from two different babies at the same time. And again, you can only know this by feel. In this case, you need to push one of them back. Actually, you probably want to push both of them back and find the one that's easier to get out first, kind of untangle them in order to get them out. So for all of these, if you're going to have to reposition kids, you want to make sure that you have somebody with small hands, gloves, and lube. So some signs that you're going to see that there might be a problem is if you have more than 12 hours from the start of that stage one labor. So if she's been acting uncomfortable for more than 12 hours, you might want to glove up and check. 
or it's been more than two hours since she started pushing and she hasn't delivered anything. Again, glove up, lube up, lube up and check. Or there's been more than 30 minutes and the appearance of the, since the appearance of the amniotic sac or the birth of the, of the kid. So, okay, so you have, you have an amniotic sac or you have feet, but the kid's not coming out. And it's been more than 30 minutes. So again, you're going to want to glove up and lube and check. So some signs of distress that you might see is if there's a lot more blood than what you would expect at a normal lambing or kidding. So maybe there's, maybe a blood vessels burst or something, or the, you or the doe's getting really tired. Or you have a really concerning malpresentation. So let's say it's been more than two hours since she started pushing and you don't see anything. So you go in and check and and then you see something where you just really can't, yeah, that kid, there's no way that kid's coming out on its own. And so head back, head only, two kids at once, front and back foot. So those are the main, the most concerning malpresentations. Those are the ones where she is absolutely going to need assistance. There, there's a question, uh, which of these like poses is the most concern um, with oxygen supply? Um, so for oxygen supply, any of your rear facing positions are going to be the most concerned for oxygen supply, but pretty much anything where the, if the head's not coming out, if the head's back, anything like that. So you have to work fairly quickly with those, but still, I mean, even the one that was spine first that I delivered that one. She would, it took her a little while, but she started breathing within a minute or so of being born. But pretty much any time where the head's not there, I'd be concerned about oxygen supply if it takes too long. But especially, but especially the rear first, because once you get that umbilical cord in the birthing canal, that's going to cut off the oxygen supply. So any of the ones where the umbilical cord is not yet in the birthing canal, you still have some kind of an oxygen supply. But if they're rear facing, you need to get them out quickly because that umbilical cord is going to get cut off and they won't have that oxygen supply from the umbilical cord. Okay, so when you are manually repositioning, you want to make sure that you prevent uterine tears because uterine tears are a death sentence for that ewer dough. It's really difficult to save one if there's a uterine tear. So you want to make sure your fingernails are trimmed. And you want to cover the feet of the lamb or kid with your hands while you're repositioning because those, so uncut fingernails, you know, on, especially if your hand is not fully gloved, but even through gloves, uncut fingernails could potentially tear the uterus. And then also the feet of the kid could potentially tear a fragile uterus. You want to make sure you use lubricant. Ideally, the person with the smallest hands is the one that's going to go in and, and try this. You want to wash your hands first and then you want to glove. And so in order to put your hand in and to check, you're going to start with two fingers. So you're going to start with your two fingers in the vagina and you're going to gently work your entire hand into the birth canal. So you might have to expand it a little bit. You might have a dough that hasn't fully dilated. So you might have to manually dilate her. And so at that point, you're going to gently feel what parts of the lambs or the kids are in the birth canal. So some things you might want to feel for. So feel for nostrils. Those are pretty easy to recognize by hand. Feel for feet, feel for the tail. So those are some parts that are pretty easy to identify even if you can't see them. And so those are kind of the body parts that I look for. The spine, if that's all you can feel, it's pretty obvious what that is. So if the head is back, you want to push the entire lamb or kid back into the uterus. And then you're going to start looking for the nostrils or the jaw. And then if possible, you're going to try to get your hand behind the back of the skull and work that head into the birth canal. So the note with nose first and one foreleg at least. And then once you get that head into the birth canal, then you can provide gentle traction each time your you or doe pushes. So you don't want to pull unless she's pushing. So you want to work with her, not against her. Okay, and so if you have a true breach, so if you feel a tail and 
So if you have a really small kid and it's a true breach, then, then it could probably come out. But if you have a larger kid that might give some trouble, you want to push the lamb or the kid back in and you want to work your hand gently down to the hind legs and then gently move the hind legs up, the hind feet particularly, up into the birth canal. And then once you have the hind feet into the birth canal, just gently using gentle traction every time she has a contraction, it should easily come out at that point. Okay, so if you have the head only, you want to push back the head and gently fish for one leg. And then, again, you're going to cover the hoof with your hands and try to get that one leg and the head into the birth canal. Then use gentle traction towards the feet as she gives her, as she has contractions to be able to move it out of the dough and give birth to that lamb or kid. If you have two at once, you want to push them both back and then figure out which one's in better position to come out and then get that into a deliverable position, whether that's hind feet first, whether that's one front foot in the head, whether that's normal position, but some kind of, some kind of position where it can be born is what we want to do. Okay, so how do you know when to call the vet? Well, let's say she's in pre-labor. She's weak or lethargic and she's not responding to what you're doing at home. Or if she has excessive bleeding and you're not sure what to do about it. Or she's been in stage one labor for more than 12 hours and you check her and the cervix is still closed. So these are conditions pre-labor where you might call a vet. During labor or post-delivery or post delivery <clears throat> so if you have a lamb or kid that's too big to be delivered, even if you give some gentle assistance, or it's in a position that makes delivery impossible, there's just no way you can get it into a good position. And a lot of people, if they have a spine first delivery, you may very well need a C-section in that case. If you cannot get that kid positioned to where it can come out, or it has a defect that makes delivery impossible. Early in the time when we were raising goats, we had a doe that had Cache Valley virus, and she had a kid that had locked front knees. There was no way that kid was coming out without a C-section. The other thing is if your doe is going to shock, you want to call the vet immediately. And that does happen you know, if there's a very traumatic delivery. So here's a video of assistance, and again, this is you that probably could have had the lambs on her own, but this is an example of how you give assistance if you need to. You want to make sure that you glove up to protect your hands and to also protect the you or the doe. And then you want to make sure that you are going slowly, so you don't rush. So he's slowly working his hand into the vagina of this you. So he's finding the feet and the head. Make sure they're in the right position. We see a foot. We see another foot. Is working with her contractions. You give gentle traction to this lamb. The 
There's a nose. And so he's clearing the amniotic sac away from the face so that it can breathe. So you want to make sure if you are going to assist, you always pull toward the hind feet. You don't want to pull straight out. You want to always pull toward the hind feet. And so if the lamb or the kid doesn't start, doesn't start breathing immediately, you could tickle the nose with straw to get it to take a breath. And then you want to just give mom and kid some space or mom and lamb some space so that she can take care of it. This is in the case where you're going to dam raise the, the lamb or kid. In some cases, you might want to bottle raise. If you're going to let her raise her own lamb or kid, then back away and give her some space. So what if she needs a C-section? So most of your large animal veterinarians will per, you know, perform a C-section on the farm. And if it's required, you need to make sure that you have a clean area available for the veterinarian to perform the surgery. Some will actually do a standing C-section where they will use local anesthetics. If you have, you know, some kind of a stand or stanchion, or a grooming stand or a stanchion to restrain the animal. So as the breeder, your job is to stand by with plenty of clean, dry towels and a bulb syringe to suction noses and then to work with your veterinarian and follow their instructions. But any kind of situation where they can't be born on their own, even with assistance, that's when you call your vet for a C-section. So after she lambs her kids, what's next? She's going to, this is considered stage three labor. She's gonna pass the placenta and this should happen within six hours. So if she had a really stressful lambing or kidding and she seems exhausted, this is when I personally would give a dose of oxytocin because it's just going to help with passing the placenta. If you don't have a, if you don't have a source of oxytocin, you know, massaging her udder will release oxytocin naturally. You need to work with your veterinarian for the, the correct administration and dosage for oxytocin. And this is a prescription drug, so you will need to get it from your veterinarian. So if she's been working on passing the placenta for six hours, you can add some weight to the placenta to help her get it out, but do not attempt to pull it out yourself. That can cause her to hemorrhage. And if it's been more than 24 hours and the placenta is still not passed, then you want to contact your veterinarian. A retained placenta can cause uterine infection and can cause death. So at this point, the lamb you're kidding is done, then your, you or your doe is going to bond with her kids. And immediately they should want to nudge and lick their babies. So that's showing that they have the maternal instincts that are necessary. It may take a little while, but ideally your lambs or kids will nurse, will be up and nursing within an hour. Some may take a little bit longer, but they have to have that colostrum within the first 12 hours. If you have, if you're you or your doe had a rough kidding, then she may need some assistance, you know, with taking care of the lambs or kids. Okay, so going back to some of our previous slides, questions: Are these position moves doable while the kid is still in the sack, or will it need to break before repositioning? Typically, the amniotic sac is going to break as your as you're working with the kid, that, that just kind of happens. But hope what you want to do is if you are having to reposition a kid, you want to do it quickly so that it doesn't dry out to, you know, before you can get the kid out or the lamb out. And so in the case where you have a so you have a, a you or a doe that does not accept her lambs or kids, then Ideally, you're going to do it, if you're going to try to graft it onto another you or doe, hopefully you have one that is lamb or your kidding at the same time because those hormones are what's going to help them adopt another lamb or kid. If you wait past 12 or 24 hours, for sure, but usually within 12 hours is your main time for the hormones, 
And so if you're trying to graft them, you ideally want to do it to one that's within 12 hours of kidding so that you can have those hormones. But they need colostrum within 12 hours, regardless of how they get it, whether they get it from bottle or from their mother or from another mother. But you can take a young, an older lamb or kid and graft it onto a ewe or doe that is just kitted. That's a possibility. But that ewe or that doe, in most cases, you'll have some that will let anything nurse, but most of them are only going to accept a new lamb or kid within that first 12 hours after lamb or kidding. And so if you have one, if you have a ewe or a doe that's just exhausted, giving her a boost, some warm water with molasses or some you know, jumpstart gel or something that has some carbohydrates in it can help, some sugars can help give them some energy. And then just kind of give them some space. Let them have some time to bond with their, with their lambs or kids. But you might have a, a young ewe or doe that this is her first time. She does not know what these things are. And so she might need a little work and a little assistance to figure out what she's supposed to do. And so you want to make sure, especially in this case, if her instincts don't kick in within an hour or so, you might want to restrain her so they can nurse, so she can kind of learn what it's all about. Because not, not all of them take to being a mother naturally. And so just you want to make sure you keep a, an especially close eye on first timers. Okay, and I'll switch it over to Mary to talk about the first 24 hours. Yep, so our first 24 hours is one of the most important uh, time periods in our, our new lamb and our new kid's life. So making sure that they get a really good start is going to be uh, key for their success going forward. So... Um, in the warm weather, you know, kids may not be need a lot of help or lambs um, may not need a little help or intervention at all. Um, it, they don't have that risk of necessarily getting cold um, and things like that. But in the cold weather, which is when we're going to be lambing and kidding um, for a lot of our show animals um, or just around here, uh, that's, a, that's, you know, kind of the ideal time uh, to lamb or to kid. Um, and so checking and making sure we don't have any newborns um, born that are they're getting too cold um, out in inclement weather is going to be key. So um, if you find someone that's cold, go ahead and get them dry, clamp the cord, uh, and make sure those nostrils are clear um, so that they can be get breathing and not get gunk in their lungs. Um, if you're going to be dam raising, so most of our um, lambs, if you have a, a dairy sheep or dairy goats, more likely those those kids or those lambs are going to be taken away. But if they're going to be dam raised, make sure that uh, that bonding does happen between that dam um, and that that lamb or that kid. Uh, like Sarah said, you can graft um, within about the first 12 to 24 hours onto a new mom. I always suggest if you've got a new mom that just had babies, take the, the placenta um, or that water sack, try to get that scent onto the baby you're trying to graft uh, so that it, it smells more like, you know, that that you were that damn, um, they're gonna be much more likely to accept that new baby. Um, but sometimes they just, they won't. Uh, you, have, you have ones that just, you can't graft onto. Um, if the lamb or the kid is really weak, make sure you get them warmed up um, and monitor carefully. Make sure if they need assistance, you're getting them tubed um, or you're helping them nurse, getting them up and standing. Um, and then check on them every couple of hours to making sure that they're still warm, they're still feeding, um, and they're in the right direction and not going downhill. Uh, and if you're nursing or bottle feeding, um, again, if you're pulling them straight off the dam to bottle feed, making sure you have that colostrum replacement, um, either that powder or you're milking out and providing that colostrum to those lambs or kids within the first 12 hours. The reason it's key in the first 12 hours is because the particles in the colostrum that uh, the animals need to start strengthening their immunity um, are really big. And so at the first 12 hours, their gut intestines have bigger pores that can absorb those particles. After 12 hours, those pores get smaller and smaller and can't absorb, so they're not getting the immunity um, that they need out of that colostrum. And so it's just like giving a milk replacer at that point. Um, and so getting it the classroom to in the first 12 hours is going to be key for their survival going forward. Um, 
You want to make sure you have your plan set up kind of before. Uh, again, if you're raising dairy goats, you know, they're, they're probably going to be bottle fed. So having those pens set up, being ready for that ahead of time. Um, so you're not trying to scramble when you start having babies uh, will be key. Some use, they just don't accept it. Um, first time moms, you know, may not, and they have had lambs or your kids before and they're just like, nope, not doing it. Um, if they, especially if they have a really traumatic uh, birth, it might be harder to get them to accept those babies. So you may have to bottle uh, feed. So it's good to have the equipment on hand so you're ready um, and you're not trying to run to the store uh, ahead of time. If you're not comfortable caring for for weak lambs, make sure you call you know your vet or somebody around that you uh, feel comfortable with getting um, help from that that it's agreed like hey you can call me or we can come you know take these weak kids or come over and help you um, with those to try to help get them up and going. Uh, again, making sure the the membrane and, and it's clear of the nose so they can breathe. Um, you want to rub them very vigorously with the towel. This starts kind of um, getting their lungs to start working and also drying them off and, and getting them started. Um, check for a heartbeat to see if there's anything present um, and then see if they start, you know, moving their eyes. Uh, that's all signs that, you know, we do have a live lamb. Um, you know, if they're cold, you want to make sure to get them warmed up again with a heat pad, a water bottle or a hair dryer, um, and then give them a little time to kind of get settled. You don't want to immediately go in trying to tube them, especially if they're cold. If they're cold, all of their energy is going to try to warm them up and not, you know, you utilize uh, their their digestive functions. Um, and so you could be too big them. It's just not going to do anything while they're cold. They have to be warm to be able to digest and utilize that milk. So get them warmed up, making sure their mouth is warm. You know, stick your finger inside their mouth, making sure that's warm uh, before you try to you bottle or tube that baby. Um, if the lamb or kid doesn't stand within an hour, uh, you either some milk some colostrum out and tube it um, or bottle feed it if it's strong enough to, to suck. Um, if they're still not strong enough, you can give them vitamin B complex and BOC uh, can help kind of boost those kids. Again, consult your vet for your dosage and, and the usage there. Uh, if nothing's still working, they're kind of lethargic, they're they're warm, but they're not doing much, give them a little caro syrup or that molasses and power punch to try, try to get them um, up and going. Uh, and then if it's cold, you may have to bring them in the house. Uh, we've had some in dog crates before on a heat pad trying to get warmed up. Mom didn't want anything to do with them. And um, and so that may just be you know necessary um, in the cold winter months to, to get them warmed up. Hey, Mary, we have a question. So uh -huh. once they are dry, will they be able to stay warm on their own? If not, how long do we need to keep them warm before they maintain a body temperature? Yeah, so so that's going to be a case by case basis. Um, and so if they're not eating, getting up and standing on their own, they're not going to be able to retain their and, and, and manage their own body temperature. Um, and so you want to go out and, and feed them regularly, making sure they have that food as long as they're warm um, and then just kind of watch them and monitor them. Um, we've had some that we thought, hey, you know, they're doing great. We've got them going. They're they're standing up and going. Then we go out in a couple hours and they're cold again um, because mom wasn't letting them nurse. So going out, watching it, and making sure um, it's going to be a case by case basis depending on on that you um, and that lamb or that that new kid. So additional considerations. Um, if for lambs, uh, tail docking is uh, is kind of a, a contentious subject. Um, really, it's important though to help keep that animal clean, especially on wool sheep. So wool sheep don't have very good control of their tail, and so they can't lift it when they uh, when they poop, and so that gets kind of stuck under there, um, and they can attract things and, and increase our our chances of fly strike. Um, and hair sheep, they have a, a more control over that, so it's not necessary um, as it is in our wool breeds. Um, it can cause pain uh, during you know, during that, but if depending on the the type of procedure you do, that's a pretty temporary pain. Um, and sometimes if you dock too short, uh, like I've seen some pretty extreme docking, especially in our club lambs, um, trying to get that you know a, a cleaner. Uh, Hip, hip area, um, it can cause vaginal prolapses. However, um, there's studies shown that vaginal prolapses are actually more linked to genetics um, rather than docking too short. 
Uh, like I said, there are people that take it to the extreme and actually like surgically remove um, that last uh, vertebrae. You know, that's going to increase our likelihood of prolapse. But um, usually our, our vaginal prolapses are, are going to be tied towards genetics. That's why it's really important to kind of keep those records. If you have a, a, a line that's consistently um, you have trouble with prolapses, look back. And it's, it's more than likely going to be linked to one sire. So you should probably um, get rid of those females as well as that sire. So we're not, um, you know, prolonging that, uh, that problem in our herd. Some techniques, uh, banding is probably the most uh, common. And so uh, the band is using a lastrator. You put a band uh, right on those vertebrae, basically just cuts the blood supply off to the rest of the tail. It'll slowly die off. Uh, the pain, however, can tend to last a little bit longer than some of the other immediate. You know, they get cut off and they're gone. Um, however, this is probably the one that's most uh, commonly used throughout the industry. Um, a hot blades can be used to cut through the tail and cauterize all those blood vessels. Uh, again, the pain is a little bit less and it's more immediate because it's, it's immediately cauterizing that and then it's gone. You don't have that prolonged period of waiting for that tail to fall off. Um, but it is a, it's, that one is, you can get a little more tricky. You want to make sure you're right in the exact spot and have a little more experience with that. Um, and then banding along with crushing. Um, so a bloodless castrator come through and crush the tail. Um, for about 10 seconds after that band is applied, again, um, that's good. It's, it's cutting off the blood flow from the tail and it'll eventually um, come off. And it can be a little bit quicker than banding alone. Um, a little less pain there. Disbudding in goats, um, again, it's hotly debated because of the pain factor, um, but it, it's safer for, for yourself and those animals. Um, you're less likely to get a head caught in a fence and then you know, potentially starve to death or, or a, a um, pr predator coming in and getting it. Um, and you're less likely if those animals are going to be fighting um, to hurt one another if they don't have those horns. Um, but if, you know, if they do have the horns and they're not caught up in something, they can uh, defend themselves better against predators. Um, if there's something comes up in the pasture or area, you have them. Um, as well as uh, they actually... Um, use their horns as a cooling mechanism. And so if you get rid of those, you may have issues with heat tolerance, um, you know, and disbudding. But you just got to weigh the pros and cons on your operations and, and what's going to work best for you to really determine, um, you know, what you should do at that for that stage. Um, so the castration, uh, reasons we do that is because we don't need as many of our males for breeding purposes. Um, Depending on that age, or one male can breed quite a quite a uh, number of ewes or does. So, um, also, not all of our males are going to be breeding quality, um, and so we castrate to help reduce our aggression in the pen. Also, if you don't castrate, you need to separate uh, the the boys and the girls so that there's no accidental breeding um, between you know sisters or close relatives um, and very young ewes or does. Um, we don't need a, you know, the axonal breeding to occur. Uh, if you don't castrate, you know, just make sure you separate those animals. Watch for that aggression. You might have some more damage to your gates or your feeders if they if they try to fight. Um, but if you manage it well enough, you know, you can get away with not not castrating your animals, and depending how long they're going to stick around on your uh, facility. We personally don't castrate until it's either leaving. Um, it, it's leaving as a show animal, and so uh, we do sell a lot of rams, um, and then the rest that we sell to market uh, go fully intact. Um, and so it just depends on, again, your operation and what your overall goal is. Um, surgical castration can be done at any age. Um, so if you have something that's a little bit bigger, that banding can't really fit around, you're going to need to go that surgical castration route. Um, if you're not comfortable with this, you know, call your vet to come out and making sure that um, that's done properly on your farm uh, so that you're not, you know, potentially losing an animal uh, to, to blood loss and things like that. Uh, banding needs to be done again when it's quite young because some, you know, once those uh, the testicles get too big, you can't fit the band around. And plus, there's too much blood supply there. It's a lot harder to get those cut off um, really well. You want to make sure the bands that you buy are fresh. Bands are relatively cheap, so go and buy a new supply each year before you start lambing or kidding uh, to make sure you have plenty on hand. Again, 
uh, you know, those those bands are rubber. They can dry out and crack. And, and so if you use an old band, you risk the, the chance of uh, those breaking. You want to make sure you get both of the, the testicles in the band. And so making sure they both pop through before you clamp down um, and you don't have one kind of resect up inside of it. Um, there's also crushing. Uh, again, like the, the tail docking, you can crush. Again, it's a bloodless method, uh, but it's more difficult to ensure that that's completely done. You get, um, you get both of those uh, securely clamped off uh, good enough so there's no viability there. So, um, yeah, I don't necessarily recommend that one just because it takes very experience. And again, you don't necessarily, you've got to you know, do a lot of uh, work there to make sure those are clamped off properly. Uh, a vaccination um, schedule. So CD&T is our is our main one. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're we keep up the the dams and the babies up on this. Um, if the dam received prenatal vaccines, uh, there should be enough uh, residual coverage in the colostrum to get those uh, to those first five to six weeks, um, and then you're going to hit a booster shot at nine to six weeks. Um, the six months, every six months isn't necessarily required, but if you have a trouble with anything on your farm, um, you know, it, CD&T is pretty cheap, um, so you can go ahead and dose your, your whole herd every six months, just to make sure they're protected. But again, it's not necessarily required. If the dam didn't receive prenatal vaccines, you want to make sure that they're getting that um, when they're, you know, get any sort of work. So castration, docking, disbudding. Um, because you're increasing the risk for tetanus at that point. So um, making sure you at least get that tetanus and a toxin um, and then the CDT at two weeks and six weeks uh, for sure, but that booster about a month later. Um, if you have any uh, further questions, these are some really good um, resources that you can go to, um, or of course, you can always contact Sarah or, I, or your local extension educator, um, and they can get you hooked up with somebody that can answer uh, some of your questions. Or if you have, you know, a need for a farm visit, or you're just not sure about things, just give us feel free to give us a call, and we can help you um, through any of those questions. Okay, we're happy to take any other questions you have. I know we're running late. Yes, but sorry about that. There's a lot of information about lambing and kidding to get in. Yeah, so will this PowerPoint be available to us? Yeah, so I will probably tomorrow post it to YouTube. Yeah, and I just reposted yes. yes. the, the link to the presentation. Um, in you the just chat posted box. it to me, so I'll I'll oh. I'll give it. I'll do it to everybody. So yes, yeah, so you, the presentation is in that folder. And then we would appreciate it if you would fill out the the evaluation. And I will post that as well. If you could go just click on that link in that last that I just gave you and fill out. It's it's a pretty short survey. You know, just let us know a little bit about your operation and what you learned today and and what you'd like to see us present on in the future. And then again, here are the the different links again. And then next week we're going to have a guest speaker to give forage induced livestock disorders. So this will cover toxic plants and it'll also cover forage plants that can become toxic. And so it should be a good presentation next week. There was a, a last minute question from Amy in the, the Q&A. If a dam had CDT a month prior to kidding, do kids only need one CDT? If so, at one age, um, they still do need a booster. It just, you can push that back. Um, and so uh, can you go back to that slide, Sarah? Yes. So um, instead of doing it at two weeks, your your first uh, vaccination of the lamb or kid is at five to six weeks, and then a booster at nine to ten weeks. And so um, that's helpful if you're not, you know, docking or castrating right in those first couple of weeks. Um, you can do that CDT when you do it at five to six weeks, um, and then a follow up. So about you know four weeks later, either if you're doing it with the dam is vaccinated or dam is not. So this presentation will be posted to YouTube tomorrow.
Any other questions? I'd like to thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again next week.